Okay, um, apologise. Um, yeah, I, I really have got to go at three o'clock, so I'm, I'm going to sort of belt up three thirty rather. Three o'clock and to be gone in two minutes. Three thirty, so I belt through it. Um, as John knows, um, we're probably the unusual organisation here today because of where we've come from didn't start with being influenced by Vanguard. We've been influenced by them and influenced them subsequently. Because we've been doing this sort of non-compliance stuff forever. You know, I've been, I'm in my 47th professional year. I retired 10 years ago, nearly 10 years next year, 2006. And got dragged back into um, setting up Lives Through Friends in 2008 because in my previous life, we had fought and fought and fought to get individual budgets, personal budgets, and to get self-direction on the agenda. And within a couple of years, we'd seen that public services just could not cope with the notion that people are capable of being trusted to run their own affairs. Um, and so a whole gang of people um, forever were asking us, me, me personally, and we've developed that into us in terms of setting up honest friends. Um, to work with them to do what we call strength-based practice, and that's what we can share with you. All right. Um, and fundamentally, um, and sort of feeding off what John was saying this morning, strength-based practice involves in the current and the recent history environment being non-compliant. I'm afraid it does. If you do strength-based practice, you've got to lead. It's no good asking other people to do it, which is why, why it fails in so many places, and then doing something different. People that actually want to do this stuff, which is not about establishing people's needs and deficits and requirements for service, but actually helping them to identify the life they want to live with whatever circumstances they're coping with. You know, have to be leading it to make that happen. Okay, so a lot of the, we're in an unusual position in the sense that um, we're an organisation that doesn't employ anybody. So when I was asked to set up my through friends. I basically said, I'll do it as long as I don't have to manage anybody ever in my life again. Um, and so Colin, who set it up with me, and I became the exec directors of a CIC. And we have something like 43, I think it is currently, associates we call on who do pieces of contract work whenever we need some help in, in different ways, putting teams together. Um, and Julie, who some of you will have heard speak today from Monmouthshire. I, I, um, whereas a lot of the people that employ us say we need people that are unreasonable like you because we won't work with people's systems. We basically say if you want us to do the job, this is how we're going to do it. Um, we'll say we need people that are unreasonable like you to get to, to make progress. The Winterbourne stuff we're doing at the moment is on that basis. Local authorities have come to us and said we're getting nowhere with this. And we're saying, Can, and you've got a track record of doing it, will you do it for us? And we're saying, well, we can't do it if we've got to use your systems. <laughs> So, what are you going to do about that? Because we won't agree to do it if we have to use your systems. And they always say, okay, that's fine. And then two minutes later, they're trying to force their systems down our throats. <laughs> and so the, the heat goes on, as they say. Um, but Julie, who um, in Monmouthshire we've worked with for a long time, about five years now, um, I'm, I'm very proud to be um, what she describes as her best critical friend. Um, and that's what we try to be to everybody we work with. It's, you know, we know people are working in difficult circumstances and our job is to try and help them find ways through those difficult circumstances. We can't always change um, the fundamentals. Okay. There are going to be three or four, one of which is John's, um, key points I'm going to leave you with today. The, the starting one is something we learned early on in, our, in, in the processes that we're engaged with, probably about... Do check them out, um, plan.ca or planinstitute.ca. They're a family-led organisation, need to know their history. Um, we, we, although we work across the span of human services now, but our background is in working with people who have acquired very challenging reputations, who have disabilities or brain injury or autism. 
and um, we came across plan when we were asked to um, you are, you're all too young. Many of you remember the silent minority, do you? Burrickall, the closure of the long-stay mental handicap hospitals in England. No. Check it out. <laughs> we were asked to um, do some very, very difficult work. Um, firstly, I wrote the reports following the scandal for the government, and then I got asked to implement it, and then we had to set up an organisation to do it because of, they changed the responsibilities and it was going to take several years to come into place between health and social care. Um, and then when they needed us out of the commissioning role, um, they asked us to do the really hard stuff around the people who were most damaged. One of our big observations about those people were they had nobody but paid people in their lives and nothing was going to change. They weren't going to get socialised as long as they were living in a totally service environment. And so we, we looked around for who could help us, and we came across these people in Canada. And um, they were a family-based organisation, uh, but very unusual families. They were the families who'd invented supported living. You know what I mean by supported living? No. Nobody's in the social care field here, are they? Instead of putting people in institutions, and you have an institution of three people, these were families that had said, I want my son or my daughter to have with a learning disability or a mental health problem to have a, a good life like mine and that means living in an ordinary way but with the support they need so they've done the invention and the, and the, you know, the learning by doing um, to make those things happen and then what happens when you do that what happens when somebody has a bright idea in the citizen sector or the voluntary sector and sets up a new way of doing things what happens then in the UK and everywhere else well, not everywhere else, but in the welfare world, it does. Come on, you know. Get copy, maybe. By who? Everyone. The state. That's what happens, isn't it? The state takes it over. The state funds it. The state regulates it. And before you know it, the people that have invented it don't own it anymore. The state's killed it. Eh? Well, so before you know it, the state's killed it. <laughs> and in this case... <laughs> The state was about to kill it because they had a financial crisis in the Pacific in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. You suddenly get a cut and, cut and burn government that is taking money out of all over the place, and these families are buying now, getting on. They thought that they'd set things up so they could go to their graves secure that their sons and daughters are going to be okay. But they've still got enough life in them to say, hang on, that wasn't the solution, was it? And they set up a plan on the basis of the only way we can go to our graves knowing that our sons and daughters are safe is knowing that we've put groups of people in place who are going to be for them, there, there for them for the rest of their lives, who are going to love them and are going to fight for them and advocate for them in the same way as we will. Yeah. So that's what Plan was about, it was setting that up. And as they did it, they grew like Topsy, because of Plan organisations can only be relatively small, otherwise they don't work, because they're, they are about a congregate community organisation. So they spawned organisations all over Canada and all over the USA. At that point, they're all over the world now. Um, and um, they started supporting people to, um, to take on the system to ensure their lives. And this is the sort of, this is, this is really, really quite an important idea, actually. Um, what came out of that, um, there's a number of things that I'm going to quote, but the, the biggest thing that came out of it for me was Al, as a, as a product of their experience, wrote a book. It's called A Good Life. It's published by, um, I do know, Orwell Cove. And um, it's um, obviously written by Al Mansky. And um, in that book, he spells out why we, you're all working in services of one sort or another, or commissioning or whatever, right? Why we can only ever be supplementary and complementary to people's lives. We must never take over their lives. And for us, back in 1989 or wherever it was, that became a fundamental context of what we were doing. You know, this isn't about, you know, we must not put ourselves in a position where we are taking over responsibilities, as John keeps on about. You know, we're in the business of helping people help themselves, and that's even very severely disabled people and even very isolated people. And I'll explain how we did it, because that means you've got to build support into that process that works. So... That's, that's the first thing. If you don't hang on to much else, hang on to supplementary and complementary. 
said we, we started off closing Burracorp, um, and then we started then we moved on from that to providing for the there were 108 people who had been so severely abused that their behaviours were appalling, you know, really off the wall. And we were asked to actually respond to them. And in doing so, we had to acknowledge, A, we didn't know how to do it, but nobody else knew how to do it. Um, and that, But we knew how not to do it, and we knew some core things like, don't ask bizarre people to live with other bizarre people, um, which you know, authorities still do. That's why we're dealing with Winterbourne now, why? There's all these people having scandals around private um, special hospitals because the local authorities didn't learn from Borough Court and they didn't learn from Ely and all the other scandals in learning disability hospitals. They just replicated it, but they put it in the private sector and made it even more difficult to deal with. But we didn't. We went one person at a time, said we didn't know how to do it, and then we spent 16 years working out how to do it. And it works. And that's why we're here. Um, part of the reason it works is because we were clear about our purpose. Interesting, you know, we were using that language long before I heard John using it. You know? um, uh, the purpose that still exists in these things called challenging behaviour services is about managing behaviour. And you can't manage behaviour, it doesn't work. Well, you can, you can put it in very specialist environments and you can control it. But it's not transferable to the real world. What we worked out was that we were in the business of helping people get socialised. In other words, we're going through the same process that you go through with your children if you're bringing out your kids. Except your kids don't tend to have the history these guys have got, these women have got, you know. But it's the same thing. Our purpose was to socialise people. So we needed to understand then what it took to become socialised. The other thing that we were very cl clearly aware of was that everybody that was engaging with us, we decided we didn't know what we were doing, but we weren't going to ask people to live with other people. We would set up one by one services, one by one support arrangements, and we would train our teams really well. We would support them really well, um, and we would live with people. And we'd work out how to do this as we went. Yeah? And then the next 16 years was about learning how to do that. But on day one, everybody knew that they were buying into taking personal responsibility for this. And part of what we had to solve was the fact that people didn't actually believe that to begin with. And that's still a problem today. <laughs> so going back to what we learned, we, we started off with plan, trying to work out how we were going to enable people who weren't socialised to have people in their lives who cared about them. Um, and in the process, we learned from them a different way of looking at what we were doing. Because of they, and this, this stuff didn't come from a, um, from a professional, this stuff came from a secretary. She was going out with the director of the organisation, sitting down with families and with people and professionals and whatever, and with people and saying, and, you know, what are the needs of this person and what services do they require and whatever, and she was taking the notes. And one day she was she eventually managed married the director, but that, Vicky was on her way back from one of these meetings with Al, and um, she said, "Why are we doing it that way? Shouldn't we be asking people how they want to live? Why are we, why are we asking all those questions about services and things? Why aren't we just saying what, how do you want to live? And then we can say to the networks, can you help them live like that, please? And you know, Al was an unusual guy because of a lot of." You know, he'd been the, direct, the equivalent of the Director of Learning Disability Services for British Columbia. So he's a pretty highfalutin professional. You know, a lot of people would have just said, oh, yeah, the secretary. And he didn't. He said, great idea. Let's give it a go. And the consequence was they did give it a go. And, and long story short, they ended up, when I was um, uh, an ambassador for Ashoka Foundation, who you may have heard of or may not of, but they're international organisation that supports social enterprise in the third world. I was, they were interested in what Plan had done, and they thought it was translatable into some of the work they were doing. And they asked 18,000 people, including their donors. So they were asking people like, you know, the Microsoft folk and whatever, you know, um, what really matters to you? They, they used the term, what's your good life? 
we brought that back to the UK and people in West Bromwich looked at us very oddly. Um, so we, we, we converted that into what really matters to you, how do you want to live, um, what really, really matters. And, um, but they asked that of 18,000 people, people that were multimillionaires and people who were living in refugee camps in places like Rwanda. To their astonishment, they got the same answers from everybody. And if we time, and normally what I would do with a day-long workshop is I would ask you to go through this exercise of what really matters to you and then to prioritise it. And nine times out of ten, the one that gets added always in the developed world is health. Is that, health isn't on that list. If I'd asked you, you'd have said, very early in the process, good health was one of those things. But worldwide, there's lots of people in the world who have no expectation of having good health. So it's not immediate at the front of their brain. Um, but let's look at the list. Loving and caring relationships and belonging. Fundamental need. Enough wealth, and that means $3 a day, if, uh, or $3 a week, or whatever it is, if you live in a, a refugee camp in Rwanda. That's the difference between being, being able to get out of there and being stuck there on a dollar a day. That's the reality. It's, we're not talking about great wealth, we're talking about choice here. Um, the complicated one, the stuff about being able to contribute. Essential human need. A place where you can be yourself. Uh, one, one of the people I learned from was a lady who'd spent most of her life in a huge 3,000 bed institution in Canada whilst we were learning this stuff. Um, when I asked her about her new home in her community, um, I said, well, you know, what's the difference? And she said, when I come home at night, I take my mask off. I'm not living in somebody else's workplace. People aren't telling me how to live. Yeah. Fundamentals. <clears throat> and what they established as well was that um, if people have those four criteria met, they feel safe and secure. Now what we were able to do, because we were taking time to learn, was we were able to consider that in, in the context of what was going on here. Where in terms of an assessment and eligibility um, criteria does loving and caring relationships and belonging sit in our system to this day? How important is it? How much do we spend on it? FA, sweet FA. Yeah. Um, we can talk about it, it'll be in all the documents, but we don't do anything about it. And in fact, we do the opposite, don't we? We pick up old people and say, well, actually, you're going to have to go into the old people's home because we've already funded that. And it's a lot cheaper than supporting your home. Now, that's not true, actually, because if they knew how to support people at home and they were following this procedure, it would cost them a lot less. But they believe that to be the case. You know? So it's not important. But the fact that we take people out of their natural environments, the, where their friends are, where their family are, where they've history, because very often they've lost contact with their history because they've become immobile or, or sick or frail. Same thing. You know? What's our system do about wealth and choice? We say you'll pay until you're poor. Canadians do the opposite. They say you can have 200,000 200, um, Canadian dollars before you're in tight, before you come into the category where you've got to pay for service or you lose benefits. As a result of plans work, only introduced in 2010, December 2010, National, the National Disability Savings Fund. So people can actually put money aside, they can leave it in wheels, they can do all sorts of stuff. You can put a network in place to help people spend their money. And the Canadians don't do it because they're lovely, soft, cuddly people. They do it because people get better lives and it costs less. <laughs> We've had the same conversation with the Treasury since 2008. Don't think we're going anywhere. Right. Well, they have a different view of people, don't they? Yeah. yeah. They're all strivers and scumbags. Absolutely. And, of course, we don't lack the leadership. One of the things that changed things in Canada, it was early in the process, I can't remember whether it was the Prime Minister or the President, but they had a disabled member in their family. And that became really, really important as a, as a connector to get the debate on the agenda. And when, when the Prime Minister was turning up at events and, and leading the conversation and introducing things, it made a difference. Now we have a Prime Minister who has a disabled kid die, who, who doesn't get this. <laughs> Okay. 
So essentially what we're saying is, <coughs> because we haven't got very long, <coughs> yeah, we, we have a system that is contrary to this, but we can do something about it. We learned, basically, this thing about leadership, we'll keep going, you know, ram it home, this stuff doesn't happen unless people, are, you know, so often we get asked to train people at the coalface and their leaders continue to do what they've always got to do because they believe they have to do that. The reason that Julie makes a difference in Monmouthshire and Simon, who was her boss until recently to retired, was they have been the people who consistently have said, no, we're going to do the right thing. And we believe this stuff. And you know, have been prepared to say to Welsh Government inspectors, you're asking us to meet that target, but we have no intention of either trying to do it or reporting on it. What are you going to do about it? And very interestingly, and I don't think you could do it with Whitehall, but you can do it in Wales, the interesting response from the Welsh Assembly has been, that's interesting. Well, we watch your progress with interest. Different approach, small country. I've been doing the same sort of stuff in, in New Zealand, and it's starting to see the same thing. You know, when you've got three and a half million people, it's a bit, bit different. So, um, I'm going to move on and say part of you know, the introduction today of today was a, a little bit about aren't you great people? You've all decided to take some time out to do some learning. The way we work is that we're learning all the time and every day. And I'll explain why in a minute. But it's because of there is no individual we work with and no system that we're working with that is the same. And there is no solution that we can take off the shelf. And so what we find is that our list of influencers and lists of allies and lists of expertise that we draw on just gets longer and longer and longer. When we were doing the stuff over Barracourt, um, which is the seminal side of that list, there were some key organisations that helped us come up with the framework. But you know, starting with Vanguard and going on through, it's been a whole gang subsequently. And that list, you know, every day gets longer. Um, if you go to a menu, that ain't going to happen, is it? So this is the, 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 you know, the fundamental stuff for us. We don't do checklists in the usual sense of a, you know, a, a toolkit. We don't do So they're their advisor and their supporter, not as the person that's taking away their responsibility. We're not fixing them. Um, the second question about how do you want to live is followed up with, and who's going to help you? And one of the key reasons for asking who's going to help you is for a lot of people, they struggle with that. <clears throat> and actually helping them work out who can help them and building... Um, uh, yeah, building something which includes some who's, some people, very often becomes the real job at that point. Because of yeah, we we are we've got this other silly word we use in in, in, in human services called it independence. And I meet people with disabilities who scream at me that they want to be independent, and I say, well, well, why do you want to be independent? I'm not independent. I'd be terrified of being independent. There'd be all sorts of stuff that I don't want to do that I have to do for myself. Yeah? 
There's all sorts of stuff that never get done because I don't know how to do it. None of us are independent, are we? You know, if you don't have people in your life, if you don't have social capital, you're buggered. You know? So what's this independence thing? <laughs> it's, it's silly. So that, that, that crucial recognition that people are a part of this is it, it, absolutely fundamental. And then we get to what we used to think was most important, we still think is bloody important, which is when you start to hear what people really want, then the challenge is to respond to what they're actually saying and not to redefine it in terms of what we do, which is what professionals have been doing since, certainly since the late 80s, in a serious, serious <laughs> way. Because yeah? we've forgotten how to do it ourselves. We are no longer the resource, are we, in most cases? I don't know what you guys do, but the vast majority of social workers, community nurses, no T's and whatever, are no longer, they're, the, they're not the resource. They buy stuff. They redirect people. They signpost. They don't do anything. They don't organise anything. You know? And they certainly don't do any sort of counselling and human resource, you know, sort of human interaction stuff. Well, we do. You know? But the, the crucial issue for us is learning to think creatively. It's about actually recognising that planning is about having lots of possible ways of doing things. Planning isn't going to Monmouthshire and saying, how did you do that? Can we have your operational policies? And then saying, then we know how to do it, because it won't work. Because you've got to design it for where you are, you know? Um, so it's, it is about getting underneath this stuff and actually coming up with ideas. And we use a system, again, I would recommend you look at it. You can get it for nothing off the internet. Um, we have friends at GoMadThinking, GoMadThinking.com, who um, give away their stuff, and we use it all the time. Very simple stuff. It's stuff that's based on their research into why some people are successful and other people aren't. And what they discovered was that successful people do some very sensible things when they think. And the vast majority of us, most of the time, make the same, do the same thing that doesn't work over and over again. That a surprise? <laughs> so, that's number four on our agenda. Number five on our agenda is, and we learned this from John McKnight, but we learned it before. I learned it as a community worker in the Midlands in the 70s. The community is replete with resources. But if the only thing you can do is go to a menu of things to buy, you'll never know about. So, part of what we do is actually know about those resources, know about the people, and know that Mrs Griffiths takes in washing, and know that um, if somebody's in a real crisis, there's somebody that will go and sit with a with disabled child whilst they go to the hospital with Granny or whatever. You know, this, you know it's about knowing that stuff. But it's also about... Um, knowing that if you can connect people into the real world, people do nice things for each other all the time. And if you're not part of that, it never happens. That, that's, um, oh God, there's a word for it and I can't remember what it is. Never mind, it'll come back to me. And then, so those, those are the doing things. And then the, the stuff that we have to impose almost on so many of our partners is, please don't go around saying that you're gonna run an episodic approach to people's lives. You're not gonna open and close them. People are on a journey. We've helped them identify where they want to go. But we're not going to get there in one step most of the time. Um, and by the way, we don't need to review them. They can review us. The reviewing, the reviewing them is the process of the state holding you responsible for fixing them. If we turn it on its head and say, we're here whenever you want us. You don't have to ask permission. You don't have to join a waiting list. Because we know you really well, you can ring up and you can ask, or you can just pop in or have a cup of coffee. Yeah. Let's give us a call, we'll come and see you. Works. We don't get very many calls as a result, and when we do, it's something serious to do. Yeah. Um, and the other thing we've had to really ram into people is that it's not about the money. If you start off saying, oh, someone's has got an entitlement to this, and you spend the money, you won't do all the other stuff I've talked about. So the job is to do the job without any money. And then when there are things that you really, really need to pull in and you need to buy, 
then you put the money to it. And as I'll demonstrate very quickly in concluding, just in a couple of stories, um, <clears throat> nine times out of ten, you don't need the money for very long. Some people you do forever, of course, and some people you need to spend long. This is Joe. Where is he? That's Joe, and that's Joe. Same person. That's Joe when he was ill. Um, very, very ill. Guy with go on the spectrum. He has, um, he spent 11 years in an institution. Um, like lots of people who are high functioning with autism, um, after about four or five years of very hard times, Joe had done the cognitive work without any help to get a lot of control over um, his obsessions and his anxiety levels. And he knew how to manage it pretty well. And he wanted out. Um, but his paying authority was in the northeast of England. And um, he was in South Wales. Consequence what? Nobody visited. You know, only got 100 miles an hour a week, social worker. I'll ring up, I'll ask the provider, how's he doing? Oh, he's doing very well. Oh, thank you. Got the point out. Yeah, of course he was doing very well. He didn't need to be there. He was costing him 130 grand a year. And he didn't want to be there. And he was getting more and more frustrated. And his family weren't going to support him to get out because they'd fought to get him a service. What are you doing, Joe? Yeah. So... He eventually found himself uh, an, an advocate, and the advocate kicked up stink. And we were working with his funding authority, and they knew we were local. So I was asked if I would help him. Um, interesting, you know, getting his mum and dad on side. Interesting, um, dealing with a well-known national organisation that claims to speak expertly on autism that um, told Joe that if he got involved with these idiots, uh, he would end up in a mental hospital for the rest of his life. But of course, they were earning 130 grand a year for not doing very much. Um, but that's what the market does to you. Yeah. Um, Joe, it took me six months of, OK, Joe, what are we doing? Where do you want to go? What's this about? What really matters? And eventually he told me a very simple phrase, I want to pay tax. Well, often people say that to you, is it? <laughs> oh, pay tax! Why well, do you want to pay tax, Joe? Because nobody takes you seriously unless you pay tax. Nobody takes you seriously unless you contribute. So how do you want to contribute? Well, I, you know, I miss my education. And I want to work, and I want to, I want to pay tax, and I want to be independent, or interdependent, as I would put it. I think I had a conversation with him about that. Um, so, yeah, this is a guy who's very able, but sometimes he's very ill. How much did I do for him to get him to university, to have his own place, to have a personal budget, to get housing benefit, to employ his own staff? How much did I do? Just was, was you just there for him, give him a hand? Yeah. And I suppose I stood in the background, I made appointments. He did it for himself. Very, yeah. And he grew, because he was used to being done to. Consequence was, yeah, you know, we, we did a deal with South Wales University that he could do a degree in six years. He actually did it in four, and only because he changed course at the end of the first year. Um, and he is now the um, director of All Wales People First, the national um, advocacy organisation for um, people with learning disabilities in Wales. Now he's an, he's an extreme example, but this is a guy who's costing 130 grand a year. When I worked out his first support package with him. It was 29 grand a year. He currently only spends four grand a year on his support package because of the only bit that he still needs. Is he strange with social services money, but they, they close their eyes to it because they're saving so much else. He's buying a clinical psychologist who's available to him when he wants to pick up the phone. That's the only thing he's retained. There's somebody who can help him when he gets very anxious and overloaded. Um, peering in that corner, and then I'm going to finish in a moment. Um, Somebody we helped with a whole gang of other people get into mainstream sport. I mean, with Kieran, it was getting into his local rugby club. And that's him. He, he decided that he wanted to, he was playing disabled rugby and then he decided he wanted to do the mainstream thing. And a couple of years later, he, he was the top try scorer. He was a scrum half and top try scorer for his, for his second team of his club. That would be a great photograph on its own. But 
that's not really the story. The story is because of he's engaged in the real world, he's got a job. He's got a job because somebody else he plays with has a dad who runs a painting and decorating company. They, knew, they got to know Kieran's mum and dad, who were worried about what was going to happen to him for the rest of his life. And the guy said, oh, Kieran's a great guy. I take on six apprentices a year, isn't Kieran? Kieran is now a qualified painter and decorator. He'll work for the rest of his life, as long as he wants to. Guys down the bottom are people we've worked with in Greece. Um, you take people from the UK to meet them. They've got no money. And people say, why can't we run services as good as this? Well, they're using this model. <laughs> they haven't got government getting in the way and all these bloody regulations and those expectations. Okay. I'll bypass Tony and I'll bypass that. Just reinforce these other two messages and then we're going to finish. One is the message from John McNair. If you haven't read Careless Society, please do. And if you find the Careless Society a bit academic, ring the Abundant Community, which he wrote joining with somebody else in 2010, which is much shorter and much more fun. Um, but John and Jody's research demonstrated this in no uncertain terms. Now, we've created a consumer approach to welfare, which has totally, um, what's the word, disempowered citizens. And if we don't reverse it, we're buggered. Yeah. Government, yeah, from time to time, and it's going on at the moment, government has no money and therefore they are interested in community. They don't need to be interested in community for that reason. They need to be interested in community because their job is to make community work. That's the message we keep giving them. Well, the only two thing your job is about services is not. Your job is about representing us to have the world that we <coughs> want to live in. And the world I want to live in is a world where I have control of my life. So that's, that's one bit of it. And the other bit, John said it this morning, I'm going to have to repeat it. You know, it's really interesting finding something coming from a systems perspective that just totally reinforces where we've come from a practice perspective. We're doing the same things for different, for essentially the same reasons, but it felt like it was different. You know? you know, there's no difference between that statement in terms of understanding the person, the family, the real problems to be solved, helping um, the person, I've added the family and community, identifying solutions to their problems, helping people to help themselves, and pulling expertise when it's necessary. That's what we've been doing for the last God knows how many years. Um, is that stuff I'll re reinforce it? Only happens when leaders lead. Doesn't happen otherwise. Asking other people to do it and then continuing to do what you've always done at the top doesn't change anything. We've written a couple of books, if you're interested, they're there. I'm just conscious you need to... I know, I know. Thank you. Uh, we're very proud of Much More to Life and Services because the, the lottery, without us asking them to, gave us um, money so that we could give them to families. So they just rolled up one day and said, love this. Um, we think people who are self-directing will have access to this. So they gave us some money so we could print 4,000 and give them away, um, which is nice. The Green Book is a book of bad stories. We're fed up telling the good stories because nobody ever listens. So we thought we ought to tell bad stories. And we've done it in all sorts of sort of challenging ways, including songs and poems and all sorts of stuff. Um, so, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.